the speakers. We have our first keynote speaker already on screen. Let me take the opportunity here to introduce him formally to all of you. Most of you know him already. Mr. Deepak Iyer is here. He's the president of Mondelez India Food <laughs> Privates Limited. He's responsible for leading the business of Mondelez International in this dynamic and emerging market. He's also part of the Asia Pacific, Middle East and Africa leadership team of Mondelez International. He has extensive experience in the FMCG space with close to 30 years of management experience spanning sales, marketing, franchise, and general management. He will be speaking today on the topic of building a data and digital enterprise. So ladies and gentlemen, please put your virtual applause uh, and let's welcome formally Mr. Deepak Ayer, President, India Montelays International. A very warm welcome to you, Mr. Ayer. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello and good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be talking to all of you. And thank you, Anurag and Priyanka, for, giving, for having me here today. Uh, like uh, Kavya just said, I'll be sharing my thoughts today on building a data and a digital enterprise. A good starting point would be to step back and ask the question, why? Why should we even think of building a data and a digital enterprise? If you take a closer look at what's happening around us, what's changing around us, you soon realize that there are tectonic shifts happening in consumer behavior. They are shopping online more and more. The retail landscape is changing with e-commerce and social commerce emerging thick and fast. And companies are using technology to revolutionize their manufacturing. All these will have serious implications on our business. Today, our businesses could have competitive advantages stemming from powerful brands, or let's say expansive distribution networks, or ability to manufacture complex products at scale, or let's say housing the best talent and living an enabling culture. Now, I'm not saying any of this will vanish tomorrow, but data and digital could well emerge as a bigger competitive advantage, which could sort of reduce the sheen from some of these. And hence, it becomes imperative to build a business that is tech, data, and digitally enabled. Uh, that brings us to the next question, how? Possibly a more important one, since most of us, including me, I'm sure, would have struggled to get this going. But even if we got this going, we have struggled to ramp it up fast enough to keep pace with the rapid changes around us. Right? Now, most experts and the best of reading material in this space will say, you need to build a digital culture. I'm sure you'll agree with me that this word digital culture can be as nebulous as it gets. I'm sure there are various ways to do this to build in any organization, but I'll talk about something that's worked for us in Montes. The five things that have worked for us. One is looking for inspiration from outside. Two is it's a stop-down process. So start from start with fixing a strong tone at the top. Think of putting in place a digital council. Start with test and learns. And finally, you'll need to reskill your teams. Correct? So I think these are the five things, and let me spend a couple of minutes on each of them. So let's say look for uh, looking for inspiration from outside. Now the best way to do this is to go on learning course. But think of learning from industries, companies, consultants who are more advanced than you, but yet not 10 or 20 years uh, ahead of you. So if you choose to connect with any company which is cutting edge on digital or too far ahead, you will struggle like we struggle to get meaningful examples of patterns to actually inspire our first steps, our baby steps. We can never be inspired with cutting edge examples. In our case, visits to innovation centers and business consultants, uh, attending conferences organized by experts, and holding tech days with bistro startups actually helped us immensely. Whichever way, I mean, I'm sure you'll find your way to start a learning tour, but just start it, that would be my advice. The second one as I talked about is uh, the process starts top down and, and a strong tone from the top. It is hence imperative to get the leadership's skin in the game to sign on to this journey and lead it. In our case, my entire country leadership team started with two things. One, going on learning tours for inspiration together. And two, each of us taking one clear objective on data or digital in our goals for the year. Now, it is not important how big or small the goal is, but you need to take one. And for God's sake, don't take one which says, you know, I'll automate data. And that's passing. We should have done that 10 years ago. But take something meaningful. It could be anything. It could be small. It could be large. The third thing you could do is uh, think of putting in place a digital council. It may not be from day one, but at a suitable stage in the journey, right? Especially once the leaders have signed on to this journey. Now, ideally, it should be constituted with talent one level below the leadership team. 
and tough talent you have, and surely folks who have an open mind, great learning agility, and a willingness to collaborate seamlessly between functions. Right now, each of these are very important. So it has to be a hand-picked group of people. Right now, over weeks and months, this council gives them the kind of visibility and attention that, that really stands out. That is when it starts becoming aspirational to get a seat on the table in this council. Right. The first time around, you may not get the best team in place, but eventually you will. And, and, and seating the right team is very important for the council to work. Uh, shifting on to the fourth point I talked about, I talked about uh, starting with test and learn, small pilots, small projects, launching MVPs, we call minimal viable products, right? Some will work, some will fail, but keep at it. Now you soon realize that to win, you need to skill your teams with proper training programs. Example, low code, low code. For example, OMC, OMC is what? Online marketing uh, certified professionals. These are great training programs, and you don't need to figure out which one right now. But when you do get to the stage, you'll get to know. So, so that was that was the, the part on how. And now, uh, let me also sort of uh, pause for a minute to tell you that as you traverse this journey, there'll be quite a few pitfalls and a few conundrums. And I'll talk about them, a few of them, uh, uh, but with a caveat that is not a comprehensive list, right? So, and let me start with the first one that you that you uh, already would have already debated in your minds, or will be debating now, or will. Should I start with appointing a CDO? Chief data or a chief digital officer. Now, some companies have succeeded in this, many have failed. The fallacy here is that digital then becomes the onus of the CEO and the CEO. The intrinsic assumption is that one is expecting the CEO to do the job of what the CEO and the leadership team can actually do better, which is inspiring the teams and their functions to adopt digital ways. Now, a maverick CEO can surely do that, best, but others will fall back. On the leadership team to do this and and, and uh, what worked for us at least in one is a bunch of digital ambassadors so i call them digital evangelists the ceo and the leadership team these are our digital ambassadors and they made it happen and, and the other pitfall let me talk about is this famous question of cost and otherwise associated with digitizing a company now here's my learning don't go around looking for roi too early in the game because they do not know how to measure it you don't even know what's going to come out of some of these experiments just get around to putting something out there at acceptable cost. Look at it as test and learn. You don't need to change the full organization. Otherwise, will follow. Sometimes it will be a force multiplier that you have never imagined. The other one is this entire concept of failing fast. So, so I haven't come across a single value company uh, who start with an agenda to fail. But these words are very often misinterpreted, right? The right way to look at it is failure is okay. But what have you learned to put out something better? Failure is a part of the game. So we won't kill for you for failure. But get us some success next time. And this is the right way to start looking at failures, right? And, and again, the other one that I would I would bring forward as a pitfall would be finding the best talent with the right skills and capabilities. This is going to be a challenge. Now, why? It's very simple because the best talent in data and digital space doesn't think you are the best company to work for. Rightfully so, because you're just starting the journey and in their minds, we are retarded, right? So maybe you need to work with consultants who house these capabilities when you start the journey, maybe the Greek fraternity, and, and who might be uh, happy freelancing a part of the time, data scientists, data statisticians, etc. And there's one more pitfall I think is very important to keep in mind, which is about data governance. So as you start accumulating data, you will need to build capability in the organization to organize it such that you manage privacy, you manage security. And this is where if you miss out enrolling your legal counsel in the leadership learning towards right in the beginning, you struggle later. So that was about some pitfalls that could come your way. Uh, it's not a scary to start the journey, but I think be conscious and look for these. And uh, each of them you will have a solve at some stage in your journey, right? Now, a good way to end my speech today would be to get a picture of, a, of a, let's say, a partial picture of a data and a digitally enabled enterprise. I'll paint it for an FMCG company knowing its manifestations could be very different for other kinds of businesses. And hence, this might not necessarily apply to different industries, right? So in the FMCG, let me give you some use cases for marketing, sales, and manufacturing. Let me start with a couple of use cases in marketing. I'll say, one, personalizing at scale, right? Now, most marketers want to send a personal message to their consumers and to millions of consumers. Now, how do we do that? 
Today, in the world of digital, or less a digital marketing, it's possible. A great example would be possibly this ad of Mondelez, which you might have seen in Last Diwali. Not just a Cadbury ad campaign. This is what we rolled out Last Diwali. Now, it was that time after COVID wave one, and small retailers were desperately needing some business. So our marketing teams and the agency thought of, a, of, a, of, a, of serving a personalized ad to consumers. So if you were, for example, on YouTube and you were serving this ad, we would load through Google's technology, your pin code. And our tech partner would pick up your pin code and customize the ad for you. So you will end up seeing names of four local retailers nearby you, depending on which pin code you're surfing on, on, on the ad. And this is a great example of hyper-personalizing ads at scale. And both are important. One is personalizing, and second is not for one dozen consumers, it's for millions of consumers, right? Uh, this, this is where technology can take us, right? Personalizing ads at scale. The other one could be using first-party data. So for example, General Mills in the US, I'm going to understand, accumulated more than 50 million unique consumer identities and got to know the attributes, what we call likes and dislikes of these consumers, right? This helped them customize their ads uh, to these consumers, which helped them significantly improve the media ROI. There's a great use case for inspiration, and this is a great case where you have a proven ROI uh, uh, when you associate it with the cost. And the cost here of accumulating first party data is pretty huge. Now, those are two huge use cases for marketing. Now, moving on to a couple of use cases from sales. So, let me start with saying big data to expand distribution. How does our salesman know? which village to start distributing our products to. We have six lakh villages in this country, right? But today with Google Maps, it's possible to know which village has a metal road, which has a post office, which has electricity, how many houses in that village, how big does this habitat look on, on the screen. Now using these key attributes of villages, they can open the right villages. Otherwise it can be very confusing. It's almost like finding a needle in the haystack to go to 600,000 villages to see which one has potential, right? physically impossible. So that's a great case of, of, of uh, this is a great use case. Many companies are using this at scale in using big data. So when I mean big data, big data is any data that is lying outside your organization. Now, now let's look at another one, which is again being used by many companies at scale. This is about uh, using analytical engines and machine learning for suggesting the perfect order to the salesman. See, one challenge if you've been in sales, most sales managers won't resolve is for their frontline the salesman to sell the perfect order to every store every day. Which SKU and what quantities? Now, if you had a magical solution that could that could solve this, this would be the biggest solution in sales. Today, using your past data, which you have accumulated uh, of, of, of your sales that store, using big data and some advanced analytics, we can get machines to simulate the perfect order. And over time, with machine learning, the machines can themselves improve on these algorithms, right? And suggest the perfect order for every store, every day improve. Now, these are two great examples in sales, right? So these are things which can dramatically shift your sales capabilities and your ability to execute in the market. Yeah, and let me let me finish with a couple of use cases in manufacturing. So let me start with augmented reality. Now, last year, just before COVID, I'll give an example. We were in the process of shifting a line from one of our factories in China to India. Then COVID struck. And our OEM representatives couldn't be there on site. So they were in Europe and they can travel neither to China nor to India. We still managed to ship a big complex chocolate line from, Ch from China to India using advanced mobile platforms and augmented reality. Using high-tech cams mounted on the overalls of the, of the shop floor colleagues, the OEM sitting in Europe to guide them on dismantling the line, packing it and shipping it. Then in India, guide our operators to unpack and reassemble the line. All this flawlessly, and believe you me, no delay from the original shipping. Look at where technology is taking us. So th this is one example in manufacturing. Let me give you the other example. It's possibly the most stunning example. Think of IoT, Internet of Things, right? And an industrial application, let's call it IIoT, right? This is an application of connected devices. So four years ago, we started putting sensors in all our machines in our Sri City factory and started getting key readings of machines like pressure, temperature, vibrations, et cetera, onto the laptop. Now, these are baby steps towards what we thought would help us in building an integrated digital factory towards building a smart factory. Now, at that time, we didn't know there'll be such a use case. But come COVID wave one and the stringent locks, lockdowns along with that, 
our ship supervisor could not travel to the factory because she, he was traveling from a different district. Whereas all the operators were able to come. So our supervisor took the call to run the factory from his laptop sitting at his own. Right? And he successfully ran the entire ship flawlessly. Now, if you recall a point I'd made earlier, don't fuss too much about ROIs if it's a small spec. Here is a classic case where connecting devices for connected connecting machines to devices wasn't such a huge investment. And at that time, somebody had asked me, what's the ROI? I would say, I don't know. But today, after running that shift for, for uh, or running three shifts for that one day, this is this has had a huge, this has been a force multiplier, and the ROI will be more than a thousand percent, right? So let me end here, hoping this session was a bit useful in either initiating you or, or accelerating you towards building your next big competitive advantage, which is what, according to me, is a tech data and a digitally enabled enterprise. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.